And Lord, we're looking forward to hearing from Reverend Terry today, Reed, and we pray for an anointing to be upon him, Lord Jesus. You know anything that might be concerning him with his family and illnesses and situations that are going on there. And so we just pray that you give him the words that we need to hear today. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We're surrendering at the feet of Jesus, waiting to hear what the word of God has to say to us. And we're willing to respond with a yes and amen. So put your hand upon him as he comes forward. Place your words that you want him to say to us. Give him the boldness of the words that are coming from you. And we thank you, God, because that's what church is all about. We come to hear from you. We come to worship you. We come to thank you. We come to praise you. Thank you for our worship team. Although it's only a couple today, the presence of God came, and that's all that matters. You use these two gentlemen to lead us into the presence of God, and I thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. We look forward to what you want to say to us today. We're all ears, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I'd like to introduce to you those of you that do not know, or maybe you're watching online, but Terry Reed, has, as he comes forward, he's going to be speaking to you. He's, as uh, Sam said, he, he was one of the professors at the seminary way back in the day. He's a retired missionary way back in the day, but he's still a missionary, aren't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. And, um, out in Haiti, and we've done some projects there, and Great. we're gonna be getting updates on that in the new year. And so I'm really pleased to introduce to you, those of you that do not know him, I'm very happy that he could be with us today, and we're waiting to hear what thank God you. has to say through you. So thank God you for taking you. the time to fill in when I'm supposed to be gone. <laughs> but hey, I wanted to hear from you anyway. Oh. God bless you. And uh, welcome to each of you, and what a indication it is to all of us that Pastor Becky and Rob love our church and love you and are committed to this church because many pastoral families take advantage of their vacation time to go somewhere else. But uh, they're here with us today. And you know, Pastor, I'm reminded of the church where the, the uh, superintendent came and visited the church and there weren't very many there. And he said to the pastor, he said, well, didn't you tell them I was coming? And the pastor said, well, no, I didn't, but they found out somehow. So <laughs> maybe, maybe words gotten around. Oh my. Well, look, at, look on your screen. Our title this morning is from the book of Nehemiah and his words, his vow. He is saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. We want to concentrate on that theme this morning. Our Mosaic class studied the books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah this past year, and what a rich study that was. Some of you are here this morning were in that study. Wonderful, wonderful study, and we, we looked at how in 586 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar finally came and destroyed, totally destroyed Jerusalem, the, the altar, the temple, the walls, everything beaten down, and took off millions of refugees and sent them into Babylon as captives. Well, as Jeremiah said, they were to be there for 70 years and then they were to return. And so, 70 years later, approximately, God appeared to uh, Cyrus, King Cyrus, uh, and he said to him, send the people back. And so he sent the, the, uh, the people back uh, to Jerusalem and Judea, Judah. And the interesting thing is that when they had destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, they carted off all of the gold and the silver and the copper and the bronze. All of it went to Babylon. Huge shipment. Now, when Cyrus says, you guys go back now and build that city. God has told me to send you back. Guess what? They carted everything back again. And so when Zerubbabel arrived there, there are three waves, actually, of, of those who return. And when Zerubbabel leads the first group, he comes with this. Now, there's only, two or three, there's only a few thousand people that return. Many of them had settled in, in Babylon and didn't return, but some did. And here they are carting everything back. But when they get there, there's, there's no city. It's just rubble. 
Uh, and, and so it was Zerubbabel, first of all. And then Ezra it brings the second wave back a few years later. Now, Israel, Ezra is a priest. Uh, and, and he is, of course, interested in worship. And he, he sets to work on building the altar and then the temple. But now 70 years has gone by and the walls aren't built. And so Nehemiah, uh, God gives this vision to Nehemiah of building a wall around the holy city. Now, Nehemiah doesn't appear to be very prepared for that. He has been a wine taster. He, he has tasted the wine given to the king uh, so that the king wasn't poisoned by somebody. Now God calls him to build a wall. Uh, as, as unprepared as he was, yet he's a layman and he's ready to do what God asks him to do. So we come to uh, Nehemiah then, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, to kind of give us the center of, of what we're going to be uh, trying to share with you this morning. Here's the word of God. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Oh, sounds good, doesn't it? But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. And I like the version that says, the words of Nehemiah, I love it when it says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Now, when Nehemiah arrives, he looks the situation over, then he encourages his people to go to work. In, in Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18, we read this. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. And he also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. I was the king of Babylon when he sent Nehemiah back. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But you know, uh, th there are always opposition to the work of God. And Tobiah and Sanballat seemed to be specialists uh, in the area of opposition. One was a leader of a Gentile area to the south. One was a leader uh, to the Gentile uh, area to the north. Thank you, David. Uh, and uh, they were uh, totally opposed to all that was going on. Uh, so they, they, uh, they threaten his lives, their life. They threaten the lives of those who contribute. So at one point, uh, the class was amazed by this, at one point they were building so consistently from sunup till sundown. They were all there building a wall around Jerusalem. And it says at one place that they slept in their clothes and they worked in the same clothes. They didn't need to take time to change. Well, that must have been an interesting situation, huh? And they, guess what? They carried a trowel in one hand for building the wall, and in the other hand they carried a sword. Because that's how dangerous it was. But so committed were they that they, 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 they built that wall, we read, in 52 days. So the enemy comes to Nehemiah four different times, and uh, finally said to Nehemiah, you know, if there's any di if difficulty in this area, if there's any rebellion, we're going go, to tell the king of Babylon that you're the one that's raising this, this whole opposition up. Tried to get him discouraged. They, they demanded that he come down from his stand in building up the wall. And Nehemiah sent back that reply in Nehemiah 6.3, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. That, dear heart, is the center of our message this morning. I want to know uh, if there are lessons that we could learn from this man, Jeremiah, Nehemiah. What, what can we learn from him? So Old Testament wine taster, wall builder. What can we learn from him 2,500 years ago? What are some of the lessons? Well, first of all, I come up with this one. This, there is a leadership model for the church. You see it there before you. A leadership model for the church. He puts everybody to work. Did you notice that? The women were cooking. The men were working, trowel in one hand, a sword in the other. Built the wall in 52 days. Read in six, uh, Nehemiah 6, 15. Well, the holy city 
was enjoying the presence of God there because remember that Ezra had come back. Ezra was a priest, and he had built the altar, and he had built the temple, and now the wall surrounding Jerusalem for protection. Now, folks, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to understand that when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar had sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the altar and the temple, he destroyed all that was in the Holy of Holies. Do you remember there was, there was the tablets that God himself had, had, had worked with Moses on? There was the, there was the, 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 the rod of Aaron and so on. The, the components of the holy place were gone. Now they could build the altar and they could build the temple, but the holy place, nothing in the holy place. It was gone. There are consequences to deep-seated sin in our lives. Well, leadership model for the church were all completed in 52 days. And Joan and I saw part of that wall when we were in uh, Israel back, I think, in 2012. And it is the famous part that you know is the Wailing Wall. You see part of that today. They think that possibly, probably, even that segment goes back to Nehemiah. And by the way, Nehemiah's work is the last detectable event that occurs in the Old Testament. That's right at the end. Malachi also testifies at that very same time. And, and we, we saw the work that was done here by Nehemiah and his workers. Everyone in the church needs to be involved in a ministry because we find that workers are seldom complainers. There's this other thing here that, uh, that in, just impresses me about Nehemiah. He refuses to be detracted from the work that he believed God gave him to do. Let me turn over here again to 6.3. It says, But they were scheming to harm me, so I sent messengers that, to them with this reply, I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? You and I today feel calls to come down from the building of the wall where God has placed us. That wall that surrounds our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our neighbors, people in, in the church, all around us, there is, there is a wall that we are constructing, a wall of protection against that which falls down upon, upon all of us society in general. It's a gigantic task. But you know, it's not about you. It's, it's, it's about those who follow. In, uh, on December 17th, I was listening to national news, and there was a survey, survey done, a national survey. And the people of this country said that one of the top two problems in America is the decline in moral values. And we see it, do we not, in, in society. We see it in... in uh, all around us. Uh, but Peter it says in 1 Peter 4, 17, should not judgment begin in the house of the Lord? Calls come to us daily to come down, to sacrifice our values, the very stand that God has called us to. Temptations to drop biblical standards, to fall in line with current, current fashions, wokeism, cancel culture, the status quo, cultural normality, populism, after all, you wouldn't want to be called a radical, would you? Most helpful, of course, in, in, in resisting temptation uh, is to remember that God has called us to this task. And we mentioned that in our, in, in our singing this morning. And I love that part that says, and God will, will, will sustain us and rescue us and, and deliver us. The road that you are on is a plan that he has for your life. And when you follow that plan... And, and you're building on that wall, something happens to those that are around you. They observe that in your life there is a tranquility, there is confidence in the way you live, there is peace and hope, and they, they begin to take notice, and they say, why the difference? Nehemiah shakes up the status quo. Now, Nehemiah saw this work as his responsibilities. The walls had been destroyed, as I said, in 586 B.C., now, over 100 years later, no walls. Altar built, temple built, but not the walls. But Nehemiah said about that task, and they built it, we read, in 52 days. 
Now, it's an interesting thing that not everyone in the church, in, in, in some instances, not everybody in the church agrees with your decision in what he has called, in the way he has called to follow you. Not everybody even in the church. And I would just say that we need to be very careful where we get our, our uh, counsel in the church. Does the word from a Christian friend line up with the scriptures? Let me turn to 614 here a second. Remember, this is what Nehemiah says. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who have been working to intimidate me. <coughs> so right inside the encampment, there are people that tried to discourage Nehemiah. And oftentimes that helps with us as well. We're trying to do our part, but not everybody agrees, even sometimes those of us who are in the church. Now, maybe like me, you have serious deficits, deficits in your family history. I do. I certainly do. I know what it's like. But make the decision. I will be true to my family now. I will be true to my calling now, no matter what the cost. My mind goes back to a... A, la a lady in my mind uh, who was a builder of the wall, she had a gray dress on, but she always had a, an apron because it just seemed like Grandma Reed was always cooking. And she had her hair done in a bun in the back. My Grandma Reed was a free Methodist, but she was on the wall with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. The devil come near her, and you are going to get a sword in you. A wall, a building up of the wall... Oh, no one like her. Oh, and guess what else? She prayed, married to a non-Christian all her life who berated her and all her, her life, but whom she led to the Lord Jesus Christ on his deathbed. But all of her life she prayed, Lord, would you raise up a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary in my family? And he did. That would be me. You never know what is going to happen in your, in your prayers, praying when God lays that on your heart. Well, other calls to leave the wall. The movies we watch, the, the, uh, the call to pornography. I don't understand that. I read in Christianity Today, uh, um, this is a journal for pastors and evangelicals, not Nazarene, but uh, the broader scope. Here is what one girl said. She said, pornography destroyed my mind. Now, I don't understand that. I don't watch pornography. I wouldn't have a clue where to even turn to try to get it. But I'm just saying, what does that mean? Pornography destroyed my mind. And if this is something that we need to discard and toss down because it doesn't have a place up there building on the wall, it's time we get it done at the beginning of this brand new year. Dozens of options on the media platforms call upon our young people to come down, you know, Come on down here. It's, what are you doing up there? It's cold and lonely up there. You don't know what you're missing. You'll fit better with people around you if you just come on down and get off that, that, that wall that you're building there. But Nehemiah refused to be detracted from the work that he was, that he was doing. <laughs> Dr. G.B. Williamson was a general superintendent a number of years ago in the Church of the Nazareth. I mean, many years ago. But uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. R.T. Williams, I hope I said that right, Dr. R.T. Williams, said this one time to a group of pastors. He said, pastors, get yourself into something that only God can get you out of. The third thing here, after we talked about the leadership model for the church and Nehemiah's stubborn refusal to be distracted from his work, thirdly, I see here where truth was under attack. His manif detractors manufactured lies about the work that he was doing. Even a fellow Jew, bribed by Nehemiah's enemy, attempted to lure him to a, a location outside Jerusalem where they planned to assassinate him on the road. We saw that in 614. The prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. And they thought, well, if we can get him to come down uh, off of that wall and we can get him out of Jerusalem, we can assassinate him in the way, and, and this will take care of the problem. Because... Tobiah and Sanballat had been gaining input from tax upon these people, and if they declared their independence and had a wall, that could come to a halt. Truth was under attack. What about today? Politics. Sports. We're all, aren't we, watching sports? You're not? Okay. 
bowl games yesterday without end. Sports, world leaders, even leaders in the church who have betrayed us in this past year do compromise truth. Beloved, let me tell you frankly, we live in a, in a, in a, in a morally, we live in a moral universe. The creator, the judge, rewards honesty, and he penalizes every infraction now or later. Every dishonesty in our work and wherever it happens, the honesty, our honesty is rewarded. <coughs> dishonesty, wherever that happens, is, is penalized. Now you're saying, well, I thought that this was forgiven. It certainly can be. There is forgiveness, no question about that. But oftentimes, Perhaps even people in the church go through tiny dishonesty and untruth and even theft of one kind or another without it just become almost a way of life. You can't do that. We live in a moral universe. And every infraction is, has to be accounted for. Now, the good news is when you... I love the fact that we keep our cross here. When you come to the foot of the cross, like Martin Luther did, and threw himself down with his face in the dirt, and he said, save me, O oh God, I am yours. I talked with a man this past week. Had breakfast together. He said, Terry, do you ever ask for forgiveness? I said, all the time. I get up tight with my wife's ways of constantly building on the wall, you know, hustling around, and I say, slow down here, you know. And I have to go back and repent and say, you know, you're the godliest part of our family, frankly. <laughs> no, 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 he said, no, no, he said, I, it's the first time I've repented in 60 years. And tears came to his eyes. I said, well, how did they make you feel? Oh, he said, there was a great peace that came over me. Yeah, but that's provided by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that that can occur on a moment-by-moment on a -moment basis if there's an infraction, dishonesty, untruth, whatever it is. There is a moral universe that we are held to accountability. Oh, there's something else here. Marriages are under attack. Temptations to destroy, to destroy Christian marriages are tailor-made just as they are in our individual Lives. I read recently that there's a new trend among married couples. They are married, but they live apart. They get along better if they live in different places. What does that do to, 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 to Genesis 2.24? The two shall become one. Well, even at our work, and brothers and sisters, you know what I'm saying. The enemy of the family subtly provides an attractive alternative to the husband or were a wife that we committed ourselves to, magnified perhaps by problems in the marriage, issues with children, finances, intimacy, loneliness, depression, at a moment of vulnerability. Temptations are tailor-made to tear our marriage down. Loyalty here is at the stake. Not just for our children and our grandchildren and, and our church and our society, but the Lord as well. He's called us to this place. And we say, I am doing a great work and I will not come down. <clears throat> so, Nehemiah 6.15. So the wall was completed in, in 52 days. Then he says, our enemies lost their self-confidence. They realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Expect his intervention in your life when you are at work at the wall with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. Now we turn the page. We skip ahead 400 years. Now we have a master builder, the Messiah now. But he's challenged, too, to change course. Come down. But if ever there was a majestic divine fulfillment of the, of the vow of, Nebu of Nehemiah, it would be the Messiah. I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Well, here are some of the accusations that he faced. Lies, contempt of detractors from a number of sources. Now he's, he's hearing calls from the detractors. Uh, to, to come down, leave this mission of yours. It started early in his ministry, Matthew 4, 6. You remember the temptations of Jesus. Quote, 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. Now toward the end, in the last moments of his life in Matthew 27, 39, on the cross now, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross. Oh, there's another group. The very group that should have recognized the Messiah when he arrived turns out to be the worst. Chiefs, priests, and teachers of the law and elders say this, let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. Arrogance. But then finally, in the last moments, there are two thieves on the cross, remember? One says, Father, says to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Guess what the other one says? Luke 23, 39. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now, it's not as if Christ could not have been saved, of course. He says at one place that he could have called for legions of angels to come and deliver him. But that was not the plan. That was not the purpose. He does not say what Nehemiah had said. He says three words. According to John 19, 30, he says, it is finished. All of that that had been, uh, that had been uh, built up in the old covenant, all of those sacrifices, the, 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 you remember the, 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 the temple uh, had been totally reorganized here with the splitting of that, uh, that covering over the, the holy place, split in two, because the high priest could only go into the holy place <coughs> once a year with, a, with an atonement for his sins and then the sins of all of Israel. That was torn down now. Now Jesus takes us by the hand and leads us into the holy place with the blood held there before him. It's that one sacrifice. All of this old has passed away. All has become new. It, it is finished. And then it says here, uh, it says, um, with that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Was there ever a more adequate fulfillment of the word from, Jeremiah, from Nehemiah, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Perhaps you have made New Year's resolutions. I only have one I share with you. Maybe you could make it yours as well. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. But there's a in, in, in uh, East Africa, just before we left, I was invited to uh, teach in Rwanda. Joan and I directed a school that had about six or 700 pastors all through uh, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Uganda, Naira, uh, Kenya, all through there, lay pastors that we were training for ministry. A oh, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, vocation. But I was invited to speak, uh, to, to teach a course in uh, Kigali in Rwanda. Now, the early 1990s, you'll remember probably, was this horrible war between the Tutsis and the Hutus and the devastation. And the church was involved in, in much of that to the horror of, 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 the, of the world. And in the country of Rwanda, I remember, I remember worshiping there. I remember on a Sunday morning going into a church with a, two or three hundred of our Nazarenes. It was a bombed out building. It wasn't a church. It had been something like a factory or something like that. It was bombed out. The back was gone. The walls were, were torn down. Uh, and and uh, here, was, here, was, here was this church going on and, and doing their very, very best to, to continue with, with, with worship. And, and how they persevered, that was in the late 1990s when, when I was there. But there was a, a man who was martyred, a pastor, a Rwandese pastor was martyred. Uh, and, and the night before he died, he took a pen and paper, and here's what he wrote. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed, my present makes sense, and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, 
chintzy giving and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I now live by his presence, learn by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, labor by power. My pace is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few. My guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I must go until heaven returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until he comes. And when he comes to get his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors will be clear. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down.